Our first speaker this morning is Richard O. Cowan, who's talking about Open Thou Mine Eyes, Blindness and Blind in the Old Testament. I'll read his biography here. After receiving his PhD in history at Stanford University, Richard O. Cowan joined the religion faculty at Brigham University in 1961. So he had the privilege of being a colleague of Sidney B. Sperry for about a decade. After teaching for 53 years, he retired in 2014. He has authored about a dozen books and numerous articles in the area of Latter-day Saint history and doctrine. He's particularly interested in Latter-day Saint temples and developed a class on campus about that subject. Recent publications include Provo's Two Temples, and he is currently working on a book about Utah's temples. He currently serves as his stakes patriarch. He and his wife, Dawn, are the parents of six children, 22 grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren. Dr. Cohen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's a privilege to be here, especially it's a privilege to be involved in this uh, Jubilee 50th anniversary uh, Sperry Symposium. And as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, I did have the privilege of being a colleague of Dr. Sperry. In fact, I think I may be the only presenter at the symposium this year that actually had the opportunity to have been a colleague of Brother Sperry. And I certainly regard that as one of the high points of my life. I'm grateful for it. I think uh, as I look back, the first time I met uh, Brother Sperry was when I was a youth growing up in Southern California. Uh, Brother Sperry came to our area to give a series of lectures on our Book of Mormon. And I guess I was in high school at the time, and I can remember how I was impressed with the scholarship and yet uh, easy to understand explanations. And I think that experience certainly contributed to my desire to one day do what uh, Brother Sperry was doing, that is to uh, be a, a member of the religion faculty here. <clears throat> then when I joined the faculty at age 27, I was obviously a very junior uh, colleague, but Brother Sperry treated me with uh, love and kindness, and he was always, uh, had plenty of time to answer questions or provide counsel or whatever. So uh, I was a Sidney B. Sperry booster from the very beginning and I'm grateful for this opportunity to be involved here today. Now, uh, I can remember the first uh, Sidney B. Sperry symposiums. The, uh, they began as a weeknight evening program in the old Joseph Smith Building Auditorium. There were only three presenters. You know, look at the program this year. <laughs> you can see how we've grown. But in those first few years, there were just the three presenters all on the same evening in the JSB Auditorium. Uh, that was in 1972. And I, I guess my first participation in the Sperry Symposium was in 1977. And this is what the published uh, results of the symposium look like. You see just a very skinny uh, pamphlet in contrast to the very nice book that we have this year. So certainly the symposium uh, has come a long way since those early days. Now the topic of this year's uh, symposium is of obvious interest in today's society. Now you probably know that each year the, uh, the Sperry Symposium is tied in with the uh, gospel doctrine, uh, now we call it the Come Follow Me curriculum for the coming year. So Old Testament is coming up next year and so that's the theme. But uh, this particular time, 
the committee chose to focus more specifically on this idea of the marginalized groups and the covenant of compassion to uh, reach out and to uh, treat such groups. And as I say, there's a lot of interest in today's society uh, about such uh, a uh, priority. And obviously it's interesting to me because I personally am blind. So the topic is uh, one that I have enjoyed working on. And this presentation will, well, as the topic uh, suggests, talk about the Old Testament's teachings about the blind and blindness, uh, the causes of blindness, the image of blind people, the use of blindness as a metaphor for uh, oh, moral uh, dis <laughs> weakness and so on, uh, counsel on how blind people should be treated, and hope for overcoming blindness. So let's uh, turn first of all to the subject of uh, causes of blindness. If we just find that space bar, there it is. Now, by the way, uh, you've uh, maybe heard that uh, teachers have eyes in the back of their heads. And so uh, I can testify that in my case, that isn't true. And the ones in the front of my head don't uh, work that well, or not at all either. So if I'm on the wrong slide, uh, someone please uh, feel free to call out and say you're one slide ahead or behind. But if all goes well, you should be looking at a slide summarizing causes of blindness. Now, uh, physical blindness was very common in the ancient world. And the Old Testament suggests three major causes. One of them was natural forces. And when we think of uh, blind people in the Old Testament, I guess uh, Isaac and Jacob and Eli readily come to mind. And each, in each of these three cases, uh, the scripture states that their eyes were dimmed because of their advanced age, in other words, natural causes. Now, another major cause of blindness anciently was disease. And so some have suggested maybe this is why uh, there was the prohibition against eating pork, because pork was a possible cause of trichinosis, and that in turn was a possible cause of blindness. Now, interestingly, the commentators that uh, I saw, oh, in the Encyclopedia Judaica, for example, uh, agreed that there's no evidence that the prohibition of pork had anything to do with blindness. So as far as I know, uh, that is not uh, anything that's reflected in the Old Testament. Now, human actions. It was quite common for uh, victorious peoples to put out the eyes of their uh, vanquished enemies, I guess just as a ultimate uh, action of uh, conquest. Now, fortunately, we don't have too many examples of that in the Old Testament, but there are two that come to mind. Samson, you remember after Delilah engineered his haircut, which uh, was uh, responsible for him losing the power that he had, uh, then the Philistines put out his eyes and he was then depicted as a helpless person that had to be led around. And then later in the Old Testament, when the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar conquered the Southern Kingdom, uh, King, uh, King Zedekiah's eyes were put out. So we have those two examples of uh, human actions. Now, you might ask, didn't the Mosaic law itself provide for that? You know, you think of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Well, again, the commentators that I consulted or found 
said that yes, that seems to have been countenanced by the law of Moses, but as far as they could tell, such a harsh penalty was never actually carried out in uh, uh, ancient Israel. So human actions uh, sometimes. Well, divine power was a uh, the most commonly mentioned cause of blindness in the Old Testament. And we have in uh, Okay, that'll be fine. I can let you know when you. Okay, appreciate this help. Uh, uh, in uh, the teachings of, uh, of the Lord to Moses in uh, the scripture that we should see in uh, uh, Leviticus 19, this is the same chapter, by the way, where uh, we are told that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And uh, and uh, Moses, I, I got mixed up. It, that's a different scriptures coming up. Moses in Exodus 4. Is that one one year? Okay, it just helps if I'm where I need to be. In Exodus 4, uh, Moses was uh, asked by the Lord, who created man's mouth? Uh, who made the dumb? Who made the deaf, the blind, and the seeing? And didn't I, the Lord, now, why Jehovah would create someone to be blind, I have no idea. It's just have uh, that would be a, a matter of speculation. And the New Testament really, or excuse me, the Old Testament doesn't give any definitive answers. But the fact that the Lord did have power over vision is illustrated by a, a couple of interesting experiences we find in the Old Testament. Uh, in the days of Elisha, next slide, uh, the Syrians surrounded the city of Dothan, and Elisha's servant wondered, how are we going to defend ourselves against this uh, massive force, uh, the Syrian army? And Elisha asked the Lord to open the young man's eyes so that he could see that the surrounding hills were filled with uh, fiery uh, horses and chariots, and that they who be with us are more than they that would be with them, a famous uh, phrase that we hear quoted from the Old Testament. Well, the, the Lord then uh, asked, uh, Elisha I should say, asked the Lord then to blind the eyes of the Syrians and then later to open them again so that they could be led off to a different place. And <clears throat> so that is a rather interesting example of divine power uh, over vision. Now, a number of centuries earlier, next slide, uh, <clears throat> uh, a mob attacked Lot's home, demanding that he surrender to angels that were inside. Now, the nature of these beings, uh, I'm not sure, but they were described as angels in the Old Testament, and, and he refused to turn them over to the mob, and so... Uh, these angels asked the Lord to blind the eyes of the mob so that they wearied in trying to find the door to the house. Now, nothing is said about whether this blindness was permanent or not, but uh, it was another instance of the Lord having uh, vision, uh, power over vision. The New Testament had, uh, mentions two instances that may have uh, represented a similar similar phenomenon uh, on one occasion it was just after the uh, savior had in an in a sense announced his uh, messiahship in the synagogue at capernaum but a mob wanted to throw him over a precipice and he was able to walk through them and go his way 
In other words, they apparently saw everything else, but uh, didn't notice him. And then later, uh, Luke 24, following the resurrection, the two disciples who met the Lord on the road to Emmaus uh, didn't recognize him. Even though they were talking about prophecies about the Messiah, in other words, they were talking about the Savior, they just didn't know who he was because their eyes were holden. And it wasn't until their eyes were opened that they were able to recognize who he was. So perhaps those are similar uh, uh, phenomena to the uh, ones we mentioned from the Old Testament. Now, blindness is often mentioned uh, linked in the Old Testament with sin. You know, think of the times that prophets say, if you don't uh, uh, repent, you will be uh, blinded. Uh, <clears throat> Moses particularly listed uh, a series of blessings that would result from obedience and a series of cursings that would come from disobedience. And I guess as a kind of teaching aid, he had large stones set up on which the law, uh, facets of the law would be written. And then representatives of certain selected tribes would call out blessings resulting from keeping those laws. They were on Mount Gerizim. And then from adjoining Mount Ebal, uh, representatives of the rest of the tribes uh, called out cursings including blindness, by the way, that would result from disobedience. So it was a, a kind of uh, uh, <clears throat> learning aid, I thought quite effective. Well, we've seen that uh, blindness was linked with uh, uh, sin, but what about physical blindness and individual sin? In other words, is there any idea that an individual's uh, transgressing would result in his own personal physical blindness. That isn't really uh, discussed or suggested much in the Old Testament, with one exception. In the book of Proverbs, uh, the statement is made that the birds will pluck out the eyes of one who is disrespectful to his parents. So, uh, that's the only instance that even suggests that in the uh, Old Testament. But there may have been that idea uh, prevalent in the ancient world, because we find in the New Testament uh, an instance that may have reflected a, a notion carried over from earlier times. This is the instance in John 9, where the Savior and his disciples uh, encountered a man who had been born blind. And the disciples asked the Savior, well, who sinned, this man or his parents, so that he was born blind? And the Savior didn't refute, oh, well, that doesn't happen. He didn't refute it, but he just suggested a different possibility when he answered, well, neither did this man nor his parents sin, but his blindness uh, resulted so that the works of the Lord might be manifested in him. Well, let's turn, next slide, to the uh, image <clears throat> of the blind. In other words, how does the Old Testament describe blind people? And I think we could just say in one word, helpless. Uh, phrases such as groping at midday, uh, having to be led about and so on, is the typical description of the blind. Now, again, think of the individuals that we readily uh, think about. Isaac. Isaac, uh, you remember the instance where he was about to give the birthright, and it seemed that he favored giving it to his eldest son, Esau. Uh, 
But it wasn't Isaac, but his wife, Rebecca, who received the inspiration that it should be, the birthright should be given to the younger brother, Jacob. And it was uh, Rebecca that came up with the scheme to put uh, the skin of a wild animal on Jacob's hands so that they would feel hairy like uh, Esau. Apparently Esau had more bodily hair than did uh, Jacob. And uh, the aroma of a wild animal, uh, Esau was the hunter. Now, you might think, isn't that trickery inappropriate? Especially when you think of uh, uh, Isaac's disability. And it just seems not right to have tricked him in that way. Now, I found something authored by Brother Sperry, interestingly, in which he pointed out that uh, the family, Esau, or Esau and Jacob's family, Isaac's family, were from a different culture. And things that may seem inappropriate to us may not have seemed quite as inappropriate to them at that time. But for our point, the main thing is that Isaac is depicted as not really being in charge. And that's in marked contrast to the typical notion that the patriarch in these ancient families was really the leader, the uh, dominant figure in that family. And so Isaac with his disability was not that, at least that's the image that we're shown. Then later, uh, Jacob was uh, going to pass the birthright on to his actually grandsons in this case. And uh, they were going to receive the blessing simultaneously. And so uh, Joseph, uh, Jacob's son and the uh, two brothers' uh, father, positioned them in front of Jacob in such a way that Jacob's right hand would rest on the head of Manasseh, the older brother, and the left hand suggesting the lesser blessing on the head of Ephraim. Now, I don't know, the record doesn't say that Joseph wasn't able to see them, but the account begins with the statement that Jacob's eyes were dimmed because of his old age. So it doesn't say that he couldn't see them, but it really uh, implies that. And so as the blessing was about to be given, you remember how uh, Jacob crossed his arms so that the his right hand would rest on the head of Ephraim and his left hand on the head of Manasseh. Once again, uh, seeing that uh, uh, Joseph, or in this case, Jacob's disability needed to be overcome. Now, many centuries later, in the days of Ahijah, who was another person that the Old Testament states was blind, uh, this is in the days of King Jeroboam, and Jeroboam's wife wanted to receive a blessing, which apparently she was not entitled to, from Ahijah. And she came up with a scheme to uh, pretend that she was some other woman, a woman who was entitled to the blessing she wanted. Well, the Lord revealed to Ahijah the plot, and so it was thwarted. So it's interesting, in all three of these cases, uh, the Lord provided inspiration to see that the correct outcome was achieved, despite the problem that might have resulted from the visual disability of the persons involved. Now, uh, another facet of the description of blind people is the provision in the Mosaic law concerning offerings. And specifically, the statement is made that a person with a blemish and various blemishes, including blindness, are specifically listed, was not to approach the altar or the veil to make the offering, lest he should profane the 
the sanctuary. And then, of course, the uh, uh, offering itself, the sacrificial animal, was to be free from blemishes. And here again, blindness is specifically mentioned as one of the blemishes that would disqualify the uh, sacrifice from being acceptable. Now, uh, even many centuries later, the prophet Malachi said, if one offers the blind, is that not evil? Or if one offers the uh, lame, is that not evil? Well, you can't help but think that prov provision such as this would have uh, diminished the image of blind people. They weren't uh, qualified, they weren't appropriate to be offering or being the subjects of the offering. <clears throat> well, with such a negative uh, view, it isn't any surprise that uh, blindness became a metaphor for uh, uh, deficiency. Let's go to the next uh, slide. And that's true even today. You know, we think about uh, people being blinded with wealth or blinded by sin or, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, blindness, physical blindness being a metaphor for spiritual blindness. And think in today's English, uh, words, well, I have two examples, insight and enlightenment. Think of sight and light are things that would characterize the absence of blindness. And so these positive uh, ideas, insight and enlightenment, uh, suggest the opposite of blindness in today's language. And uh, anciently, <clears throat> uh, the prophets uh, often uh, use this uh, metaphor. For example, uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel both, uh, I guess, uh, criticized uh, those who have eyes to see, apparently being able to see, but see not, probably because they choose not to, and those who have ears to hear, but hear not. In other words, such people were uh, uh, condemned by uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And it's interesting that in the Psalms, you have almost the same language being used to describe uh, idols, uh, dumb idols who have mouths but speak not and who have eyes but see not. In other words, uh, again, blindness was in pretty bad company anciently, you might say. Isaiah, now interestingly, of all the prophets, I remember last night, one of the presenters mentioned that Isaiah was particularly, uh, it was uh, Brother Pike uh, talking about Isaiah's teachings, that he was particularly one who spoke about the, the people who needed uh, the Lord's attention and so forth and uh, are needing to be charitable and reaching out. But interesting, the same prophet Isaiah also use blindness the other way. He, uh, referring to the uh, house of Israel, his watchmen are blind. They're all ignorant. They're dumb dogs who cannot bark, sleeping, uh, lying down to slumber. In other words, here again, a rather negative portrayal of uh, blindness linked with the uh, inability of the watchmen to perform their duties, maybe not just inability, but a lack of inclination to do so. Well, in summary, uh, you could say that uh, blindness, uh, those who were physically blind were not described in very positive terms, and blindness being used as a metaphor. Next slide, we see an off-quoted scripture, where there is no vision, 
the people perish from the Proverbs. Well, let's turn now to the council in the Old Testament about how blind people should be treated. Next slide. <clears throat> and the general teaching of the Old Testament that I'm sure we're going to see presented in many of the sessions in the symposium is that those with disabilities should be treated uh, charitably and compassionately. This is the basic message of the Old Testament. And that is certainly true uh, involving uh, people who are uh, blind. Now, uh, let's uh, turn to the uh, scripture that I was got in my mind erroneously earlier. In the same chapter, next slide, uh, where Moses uh, taught, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, is where he uh, said that we should not curse the deaf, nor should we place stumbling blocks before the blind. You know, symbolically, I guess, uh, I don't know how many people, well, I guess there are people might have done such a thing, but uh, the Lord's teachings through Moses was to teach people with these disabilities uh, with uh, compassion and not make life more difficult for them. And from Mount Ebal, next slide, one of the curses that uh, was to be shouted out uh, was cursed be he who maketh the blind to wander out of the way and all the people shall say amen, amen. remember that that was that teaching aid that moses uh, had with the people there at those two adjoining mountains uh, hearing the curses and the uh, blessing shouted out so apparently it suggested that the people were on board with this idea of uh, treating people with disabilities charitably. Well, now, what does the Old Testament say, next slide, about the possibility of overcoming blindness? The psalmist petitioned, open thou mine eyes. Now you recognize there, uh, the title of our presentation. And so it was, uh, I think, understood anciently that uh, God had the power to overcome blindness, both spiritual blindness and physical blindness. Uh, the fact that that petition uh, seemed to be appropriate. And as uh, we mentioned, Isaiah probably more than any other prophet spoke about the eyes of the blind being open. There are just numerous uh, references. And I just thought it would be interesting to look at two passages that are particularly well known. Let's go to the next slide. Isaiah 35 is the place where Isaiah speaks about the desert blossoming as the rose. And in that prophecy about conditions that will exist when the Lord comes, uh, Isaiah said, yes, the desert will rejoice. It will blossom as the rose. And the eyes of the blind shall be open and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The lame man shall leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. I mean, it's interesting that we think of the desert blossoming as the rose in one context, but uh, to link it with the prophecy that the eyes of the blind will be opened. In other words, uh, this was at the center of uh, Isaiah's prophecy about conditions when the Lord comes. Then let's go in the next slide back to Isaiah chapter 29. Uh, this is the famous chapter where Isaiah talked about the book that was sealed being given to the man who is learned and translate this, read this, I pray thee. But in verse 14 of that chapter, Isaiah prophesied, uh, 
the Lord speaking, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. Now we associate that with the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and the restoration of the gospel. And then just four verses later, verse 18, Isaiah said, and the deaf shall hear the words of the book and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity, out of darkness. Again, the uh, promise of blindness being overcome, being uh, linked prominently with uh, the events of the second coming. Now, with all these uh, testimonies of the power to overcome blindness, you might expect there to be many examples of blind people, individuals being healed. And interestingly, there are few, if any, in the Old Testament. Now in the New Testament, that was a frequent feature of the Savior's ministry. So let's turn to the New Testament picture just for a few minutes for contrast. Now the New Testament, next slide, retained uh, two ideas from the Old Testament, that is a blind people uh, needing to be guided and uh, wandering and so on, and uh, the metaphorical uh, use of blindness. For example, uh, the Savior condemned the Pharisees as being blind leaders of the blind. You see both senses of blindness being employed there. And then the oft quoted statement, if the blind lead the blind, they shall both fall into the ditch. It's uh, been my opportunity to be a tour leader on uh, several occasions. And, and people ask me, uh, well, how did I accomplish that? And I said, well, I just looked for the nearest ditch. And, uh, and that seemed to be all that uh, we needed to do. But anyway, there are frequent examples of blind people, next slide, being uh, healed. Uh, Bartimaeus uh, near Jericho, sitting by the side of the road. And as Jesus came by, shouting out, uh, Jesus, uh, son of David, have mercy on me. And the disciples tried to shut him up. But the more they tried to shut him up, the louder he cried out. And the Savior called him to him and said, what would you have me do? Uh, that I might receive my sight, Lord. And the Savior said, uh, go thy way, thy faith has made me the whole. And he received his sight immediately. On another occasion, uh, a group of friends brought a blind person to the Lord and <clears throat> asking him to be healed. And, and the Lord placed saliva in the man's eyes and said, uh, well, what can you see? And uh, well, apparently his uh, sight was still distorted. He could see something. So uh, the Lord placed his hands on the man's head again. And this time this, his sight was uh, restored perfectly. Maybe the piecemeal nature of that miracle made it more impressive. Then on the occasion of the man born blind that we've already talked about in John chapter 9, uh, the Savior spat on the ground and made clay and put the clay in the man's eyes and said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. Now it reminds me of uh, Elisha telling Naaman to go to the river Jordan and wash to be healed. You know, something simple, but uh, something that the individual had to do. Again, it's interesting to see how the Lord employed more than just one sense and uh, in involve the uh, recipient's actions in bringing the uh, desired miracle to pass. And uh, the man was healed. Now, later on, uh, the Savior's enemies came to the man who had been healed and said, you shouldn't be giving that person credit. He's a sinner. You should be glorifying God. And the man said, well, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But this I do know, whereas I was blind, now I see. So uh, as we say, uh, healing blind people was a frequent 
miracle. There are many others that I could have mentioned but didn't in the Savior's ministry, but the scriptures say that when people saw these miracles, they glorified God, so they had their desired impact. Well, now, what about the latter days? Do we see any carryover from Old Testament times to the latter days? And the answer is yes. Of course, today, physical blindness is much less prevalent, I guess, because of medical advances and sanitation and so forth. But unfortunately, spiritual blindness seems to be rampant, growing, and is, be, is decried by the Lord's prophets. Well, let's just uh, look at two or three uh, scriptures in Latter-day uh, Standard Works. In the book of Jacob, in the book of Mormon, Jacob said, woe unto the blind who will not see. In other words, suggesting they may have been able, but were not willing to see more spiritual blindness. In the days of Abinadi, we're told that the people's eyes were blinded so that they hardened their hearts against Abinadi. And then an oft-quoted verse from section 76, the great revelation on the degrees of glory, that inhabitants of the terrestrial kingdom are honorable men of the earth, but who were blinded by the craftiness of men. So you see uh, blindness uh, as a metaphor for uh, lack of worthiness uh, quite frequently being used. And then there are promises that the uh, disciples would have the power to restore sight to the blind. And that this would be just like this uh, New Testament says, uh, again, section 84 states this would be a sign of those who believe that the eyes of the sight of the blind would be opened. Well, now, this desired blessing would not always come immediately. And so uh, one would have to cope with uh, the disability. And Latter day Revelation gives, I think, meaningful counsel on that subject. Next slide. Uh, from Liberty Jail, uh, the prophet wrote a lengthy letter to the saints, from which three sections, interestingly, the sections that we have been uh, studying most recently this week in uh, Come Follow Me, sections 121, 2, and 3, uh, were extracted. In section 121, uh, the prophet uh, asked the Lord, where art thou? And the Lord said, uh, thine afflictions will be but a short moment, but if you endure them well, you will be exalted on high. Then in section 122, the Lord reviewed different horrible things that could, and actually many of them had, occurred in the life of the prophet and said, all these things will give you experience and be for your good. So it's obvious that how we deal with disability makes all the difference. Reminds me of uh, uh, Ella Wheeler Wilcox's uh, phrase, uh, one ship sails east, another west by the selfsame winds that blow. Tis the set of the sail and not the gales that determine which way we go. So how we respond, uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 90, verse 24, the Lord said, uh, seek diligently, be believing, pray always, and all things shall work together for thy good. Uh, Ether chapter 12, verse 27, uh, Moroni uh, counsels, that the Lord allows us to have disability weakness so that we might be made humble. And if we are humbled and turn to the Lord, he has the power to make weaknesses become strengths. And then one of my favorite scriptures, Doctrine and Covenants, section 112, verse 10. Uh, be thou humble, and I, the Lord, will lead thee by the hand. I like the imagery there. 
and give thee answers to thy prayers. Now, being humble doesn't mean putting ourselves down, but it means seeing ourselves in proper relationship to others and particularly to the Lord. And we read in the teachings of Alma that the Savior not only suffered for the sins of the world, but suffered illnesses and, and uh, pains and so on. So he'd know how to succor us. And so as Gabriel said to Mary, uh, we can say the same with the Lord's help. Nothing is impossible to God. Well, next slide. The Lord goes beyond just counseling us how to cope with disabilities. But he counsels the Lord's church to be proactive. Uh, succor the weak. Lift up the hands that hang down and strengthen the feeble knees. And the church as an institution has responded. Uh, the general handbook uh, gives information that people with disabilities, all of God's children have equal right to participate, to be beneficiaries of the programs of the gospel, to be leaders, to be teachers, uh, to minister and to bless others. And so that's the position that the church has taken. Uh, in 1904, uh, under the direction of President Joseph F. Smith, the church organized the Society for the Aid of the Sightless with the specific stated mission of providing literature for the blind. See, this is one of the major challenges that we who are blind face and that is access to uh, printed literature. And so under the leadership of Albert Talmage, the blind brother of Elder James E. Talmage and his wife, Sarah, the society uh, published literature. They did it on a hand operated printing press. They had to moisten the sheets that would have received the braille dots so that they could be embossed and then after printing them, they hung them on clotheslines around their house to dry. You know, that's a pretty primitive operation, but they uh, attempted to begin printing the Book of Mormon. But in uh, 1936, the church uh, went to a national publishing house and issued the complete Book of Mormon. And this is one of the volumes that came from that uh, edition. Uh, there were seven volumes. There are two books like this required to make up the Book of Alma. So you can be sure that blind people don't take their Braille scriptures in this form to church. You know, you'd need a, a wagon or something to carry them in. So the Book of Mormon was the first of the standard works and others that followed. Then in uh, 1958, the church began sharing material in audio recording. This is one of the actual, this was the first disc that the church issued. It was a magazine called The New Messenger, uh, containing excerpts and so on uh, uh, for blind people, played on a machine, a turntable. It's pretty primitive, you can see. But of course, today, uh, these materials are digitized and come on cartridges like this. This happens to be the 2021 uh, curriculum, the Come Follow Me materials for the individuals, primary and Sunday school, all on one of these little cartridges. And the, we can read the standard works on a device like this. So maybe blind people would think of taking this to church with them. Well, it's obvious that uh, things have changed uh, for, for the good, I would say. Uh, the image of the blind today is much uh, more improved uh, with people such as Helen Keller, the image of 
uh, blind people is certainly much more positive than it was in the days of the Old Testament. And with the help of these uh, programs made available by the church, and by the way, church, the church uh, uh, has a department uh, for disability services that uh, is in charge of not only uh, facilitating programs for the blind, but other groups with unique needs. And so we are proactively looking out. And so today, last slide, I think more than ever before, we can look forward to a positive fulfillment of the psalmist petition, open thou mine eyes. And that the Lord is guiding this work, that he is in charge, is my testimony, which I am pleased to share in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.